the quickest way to know if someone is a, a child is having really bad problems somewhere in their life is look at their math scores. Their math scores are the first indication that a child needs help because they're having trouble mentally processing a solution and finding an answer to a situation. So I'm sure you've heard the phrase, you know, it's not rocket science, right? And I, I wonder if you could for us dispel any myths or confirm, you know, actually how hard it is to be a rocket scientist? Oh my, that's, that's a great question that you ask. Being a rocket scientist is actually not as hard as it seems because a lot of people don't know that when you're a rocket scientist, you have an expertise in a certain area. My expertise is mathematics and probability and uh, understanding how the numbers can predict the future. So when you're in rocket science, especially when we help build and launch NASA space shuttle main engines and, and shuttle launches, we each had our own specialty. Mine was mathematics and science, and I calculated the probability of catastrophic explosions within space flight. But there were also chemists that could understand exactly how the oxidizers and the fluids would run together and would burn appropriately. There were structural uh, integrity engineers that would look at how hard and, and strong the metal was to ensure that it wouldn't rupture uh, with uh, the launch or when there was an explosion to cause a liftoff. And there were uh, people who would uh, sit by in mission control, including myself, that would look at different aspects like the turbo pumps. There were people who would understand how rotating machinery would work so people would have a safe flight. So. There's different experts in all these different areas, and mine was mathematics. And so if you, if you compare that to like an orchestra, like you have a bassoon player who is an expert at the bassoon, and the person on you know the flute is an expert at the flute, but somebody has to sit above that and you know knows all the instruments and how they're supposed to fit into this you know beautiful sound. Who is that person that sits above the chemist and the mathematician and the probability person and all of these different people who, who has to be the most, you know, proficient across or, or, or is it the same type of you know, thing as like, you know, a conductor? Great question. It is the program manager. The program manager at each different location would oversee how all the different parts and pieces would come together. And then you would have the NASA program manager. Now, most of the launches uh, that have been done here in the United States have been formed by NASA. Until recently, uh, we've seen uh, commercial space flights. Uh, we've seen on the news uh, uh, SpaceX, Blue Origin, Virgin Galactic that would go into certain levels of the outer space. But it was NASA overseeing most of and all of the deep space travel. And so still to this day, NASA program managers are the ones to oversee at each one of the companies, as well as the employees with their own specialty would come together and actually launch the engine and vehicle in a safe way. I'm so glad you brought up that um, these private industry, private companies, this commercialization of, of space travel, because one of the things I wanted to ask you about was how you feel having been at NASA, how do you feel and how do you read the landscape of private industry coming in? Because I, I think about how you know, co what competition does to people who have just historically had a monopoly and it, it forces you to innovate. And I remember Elon Musk saying, you know, he, he wanted to challenge the idea that, you know, a rocket could only be used one time. And so he developed ones that could be re reused over and over again. And so as somebody who's worked in this field for 20 plus years and talk to me about how you read the landscape of the importance of government being involved and the importance of the private sector being there is an equal opportunity for both. And this is why I say that. Governing structures are the ones to ensure there is safe innovation. Uh, for example, let's look at something that's basic that's not rocket science. If you look at how a dam is built and how it holds water, there's gonna be safety regulations to make sure that dam is gonna be safe so it doesn't break and doesn't take out homes and, and the water doesn't hurt people downhill. 
it's the same process within aerospace. You have these great companies that are creating these products, and you also have to have some sort of regulatory procedure to make sure that the product is safe, whether it be space travel, whether it be food, whether it be uh, uh, food in the drug administration, whether it be all these different areas, you have to have some sort of basic guideline procedures to make sure that each one of the companies in any one of the areas operate to the same standard. So the aerospace companies and the commercial flight companies that are coming out now, it's great because a lot of the companies that are out, we've seen them contribute to space travel before. There are major companies like Raytheon, like Boeing, as well as the newer companies that are coming out like SpaceX and, and Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic and Astra. These are all private sector companies that are building innovation. And the United States government looks at these companies and say, hey, you're building great innovation. How can we support this innovation and how can we include it in our programs that we're using right now? So it's this one-on-one -on -one opportunity with both government and private sector to do things. And sometimes the private sector has an ability to create things at a lower cost value. Uh, let's say that they create a way to build nozzles on engines. Instead of it going through a three-year process of forging and casting all the metals, there may be a printing process that's easier to do that would be uh, a 3D printing process that may take half the amount of time. So there's different innovations that's created through private sector companies and commercial companies that is extremely valuable. And so we want to understand the innovation that comes from both government as well as private sector. So innovation can be not only uh, affordable, but it can also be safe. Talk to me about what a day looks like in, in, what, in your domain of rocket science. So like, what kind of projects do you work on and what does a typical day look like when you clock in, you know, per se? Well, it depends. Now I have, I, I've, been, I've been a rocket scientist, I've been a professor, I've been an author, and I've been a public speaker. So each day is different based on what I'm doing. <laughs> I have to laugh because when I was in science and when I was uh, doing science for nearly a decade, I was sitting at a computer crunching numbers, looking at a screen and crunching numbers, looking at a screen and crunching numbers, and I was sitting down. I was sitting down crunching numbers and the time in which I would get up is when I would go to a meeting and talk to other people who are experts and we devise a way to be able to construct or inspect a certain part of the engine. And that was exciting interacting with people. But when I was at my desk crunching numbers, it wasn't the most exciting exception to when I could look at the map and figure out the patterns. For me, that was exciting. Everybody's different. But I am a more of a person who is active. I like moving around. <laughs> I like doing things that is not only scientific, but is engaging. So after uh, spending 10 years in rocket science, what I did is I left and I went to become a math professor. So I was a math professor for 14 years. And so I was walking around, moving around all the time, <laughs> having to write all the time. There was not one moment in which I wasn't wasn't like still unless they were taking a test when I was sitting down proctoring, but I had the ability to walk and move and I could show the students, the next generation of the scientists, the, the technology specialists, the engineers and the mathematicians, how they could take this information and use it for the innovation that was gonna be used at these large major companies. So that day was more of writing and moving around. Now as a public speaker, I interface with people. And it was interesting before the pandemic and after, pand after the pandemic was two different type of situations. Before the pandemic, I would go and meet with everyone and it would be great. Now after the pandemic, you have to make sure that people are safe and, and people have uh, the right uh, safety measures, especially when we're in when we were in the pandemic itself. It was really uh, a pivot point because I had to learn the technology to to give virtual lectures so people could understand what was going on online and make it exciting for that. And now that uh, people are getting healthier after the traumatic situation the entire world saw under the pandemic, 
uh, we are seeing an ability to to really educate in more profound ways now, not only in person, but on, on in online. And so that's exciting. And as an author, I get a chance to do fun things like this, be on your show and, and talk and share information because um, being an author is just the first step of the process of writing a book. Because when you write a book, the first step is writing it, but you have to like market it. And the way you market it is giving away as much information and content as you can so people can grow from the information in which you've written. So that's the exciting part when I get a chance to connect with your audience and yeah. answer questions and do all this fun stuff. So thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. I want to talk about education in a second, but before I do, you know, we we often have a conversation in tech about, you know, there's opportunities for technical people, obviously engineers, coders, programmers, and non-technical people. And so I wonder, before we talk about education, you know, are there roles for people who may not be technical people in the field of, you know, rocketry? There are different types of people. There's different type of thinkers. Just like there's diversity with educational backgrounds. And just like there's diversity within how much income someone has, they can have very little or they can be billionaires. So you can have diversity in people's heritage. Someone can be Asian, someone can be African American, someone can be African, which is different things. Someone can be European or a Caucasian or American. There's different types of ways in which people uh, see the world and based on their background. But there's also diversity in thinking. People think differently. People can be of the same nationality, but think differently. And it's really important for people to respect the differences in how we think. Because as we can respect the differences on how we think, together as human beings, we create solutions and answers. So in this process of not everyone being a technical-minded person, that is 100% great. Because not everybody can do numbers. Not everybody can sit down and feel comfortable dealing with a calculator. Not everybody is uh, feeling comfortable looking at engineering blueprints. That's just not how their mind works. But they may be a great communicator. They can read the room and see someone's mannerisms to be able to say, say that person needs help. Some people are great at being able to sell. Like for me, I'm not the best seller at all. <laughs> you, if I ask someone to buy something, I'm like, you can buy it, you can not buy it. You could do whatever you want, but that, that's not that's not a person that is a great seller. A great seller is, is somebody who can read a person and know exactly what they need and point to in the product what exactly works in the product that, that's going to help them. So that's not my gifts. That's someone else's. But we each have this, this ability to provide a contribution to an overall outcome. And this overall outcome, I feel as a scientist, is being able to create an innovative approach for our world. And that is going to give people answers with science, whether it be finding solutions to the climate change, whether it be understanding how to keep people's information and faces safe in artificial intelligence technology, whether it be uh, trying to understand how quantum communications in the future can help keep data secure at hospitals and at uh, state departments and, and governmental agencies and the uh, electrical companies and grids across the world. So we have the ability with each of our diverse ways of thinking to contribute to a solution that's going to help humanity. So you don't have to be just a technical thinker, but you can provide your skills in a way that's going to help people. And that's the most important part. Yeah, I love that. Um, education. I, this, I know this is close, near and dear to your heart. And I wonder, you know, I, I was on social media and every once in a while you'll see like a math problem and it'll be like, it'll seem obvious. And then there's like a million different answers for the same math problem in the, the comments. Like whatever, everybody believes they know the right answer, but everybody's got a different answer. And then there's, you know, <laughs> then there's math problems I've seen on social media that, 
you know, explain how to do it. And then it'll show how other nations teach how to do that same thing. And we wonder why we seem so backwards in so many ways. And at the same time, we are near the bottom in the United States of 35 industrialized uh, countries, nations in math proficiency. What are we getting wrong about how we teach math? Oh, boy. Woo! That's a good question. I mean, that's a hot question. I love that question. <laughs> that's a good question. Boy, I can. Do you know what? I wish we had uh, educational officials all, from all across the world and across this nation listening they, to this particular podcast because I can listen. break it down. Let's break it down. Let's break it down. There's people listening. People don't address the fear behind mathematics. They address the answer. Mm -hmm. When people fear certain situations, it doesn't matter if it's mathematics. And I talk about this in my first book, Mathophobia, how you can overcome your math fears and become a rocket scientist. It doesn't matter if uh, you're fearing mathematics or you're experiencing fear because you're in a home where your parents are getting divorced and you're a kid. Same fear. It's shutting down the frontal brain lobes. Here's the problem with fear. When it shuts down the frontal brain lobes, it stops someone from solving problems in mathematics. Mathematics and science, STEMs, uh, specifically science, technology, engineering, mathematics, requires our frontal brain lobes to transport a problem into a solution. If our frontal brain lobes are not working due to fear, because fear turns off this part of the brain, and fear is part of the reptilian part, and it shuts down our creative problem solving, which is a part of our frontal brain lobes, and that's also, when we get older, is considered the executive decision-making uh, portion of our brain. So when we experience fear, our brain shuts down. And when our brain shuts down, it can't do a math problem. So when you're looking at a child starting to fail their math, it's because they're experiencing fear in their life. And if you don't give the child tools to be able to communicate themselves so they can address the fear and remove it from their brain at an early age, they become stumped in mathematics. They become stumped in mathematics. When they become stumped in mathematics, it affects the rest of their education. The quickest way to know if someone is, a, a child is having really bad problems somewhere in their life is look at their math scores. Their math scores are the first indication that a child needs help because they're having trouble mentally processing a solution and finding an answer to a situation. Math is the first place where you see that. So in our country, we do not have the best mental health access and priority. And it's across the board. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if you are white. It doesn't matter if you're black. It doesn't matter if you're Asian. This country needs to increase its knowledge and understanding and respect of mental health. When we can increase the ability for young people to identify their feelings, how they're experiencing things, and to identify when they are falling into one of these characters where they get stuck. And I write about this in my first book. When people get stuck, they turn into Quincy the quitter. They'll quit even before they even try. Donna the overdoer, they'll try and try and still miss the mark. Samuel the struggler, he thinks that his approach no one respects and people think he's dumb. And then Crystal the Criticizer will blame everybody for her poor performance because she doesn't know how to take ownership of things. They, students learn that at an early age. And if we don't find a way to correct that type of mental thinking at a very early age, it extends into adulthood, where that adulthood makes someone think not only, oh, I'm not good at mathematics. They'll also think, I am not worth trying to succeed in a certain area so I become a business owner, so I become a scientist, so I become a podcast host, and so I become an entertainer. It's, it's a whole spectrum of different careers that people can go into. So when we address the psychological issues that people are facing, 
we then clear out the mind to turn off the fear and then we turn back on the frontal brain lobes that are responsible for effective decision making. And it doesn't matter if it's effective decision making as a child or if it is an executive. When we turn off the fear, we turn on solutions in our brain. And that is how we provide answers to society. That's great. That's great. And so I was um, thinking about this and, you know, going through my math journey and I learned that math is a lot like, you know, putting wheels on a car. Like if you, um, or even stacking blocks, like if you miss a principle at, in the early fundamentals of math, it's very hard to get math at higher levels because the principle, the foundation is not there. So if you don't get math, it's hard to get subtraction. If you don't get subtraction, it's hard to get multiplication. If like, and these things keep building on themselves. And so when you think about, you know, to your point of helping people mentally in, in their socialized, you know, removing trauma and et cetera, and life hasn't stopped though, you know, so now I'm progressing through grades and I missed some fundamentals back two, three years ago, pick a number ago. And how do, how do, or I'm an adult now. And I didn't really get it, you know, in those school age years. How do you fix the, the car while you're driving and you only got three wheels? By this one concept that I want everyone to remember. It's never too late to learn. It's never too late to learn. And I know that from my own personal experience. And I'm going to tell you why. I failed algebra. <laughs> I failed geometry. Yeah. I failed <laughs> calculus. And I failed chemistry in school. Wow. <laughs> and I laugh wow. about it now because I eventually had to take the classes over, struggle, then take the classes over again. Then I finally got it. And then I, I got it because I sat down with someone who was willing to help me understand mm -hmm. it. And it was, I think I was 16 years old when I finally started understanding algebra. It Let wasn't, me, but before you continue, because I, I want to stop you because you just said something very salient. Is most math issues with children about the teacher? It's Their ability to teach? I write about this in my book and these are phenomenal questions. It's due to three reasons. The parent, him or herself, that has their own fear that they give off to their child through a math teacher who may not be supportive or may say some things that would negatively affect a student or it's by the system itself that doesn't give the proper structure or the foundation for someone to go far in science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Students. So those are the three root sources of why students do poorly in mathematics. And for me, my mother had a math fear. <laughs> and I, she was scared of mathematics and she, she unknowingly, God bless her soul, because she really tried, she really truly tried to help me as a single mom. She was scared. She was really scared of mathematics. And I remember seeing her take a math class when I went back to, which I, when I was like 15 or 16, I saw her take a math class and it was with, with Dr. Lee. And so she, she took me to class with her. And when she took me to class with her, the teacher himself helped me with calculus. And that's why, I, that's how I understood algebra because I started actually doing trigonometry and calculus and asking him questions because my mother was taking me to class, her beginning algebra class when she was at the community college. And that process made me start thinking, oh, maybe there's stuff I need to learn. And then I sat down with a, uh, a teacher that actually spent time tutoring me. And that's when I realized I had the foundation. Now, all those classes that I failed, there's one class that I didn't take over you're going to get a kick out of this. There's one class I failed. I didn't take over. It was algebra. It was algebra. But uh, I'm a spiritual person. And I truly believe God was helping me because the, the class that I started teaching, the first class I started teaching on an ongoing basis after I left rocket science was an algebra class yeah, to yeah. adults. Wow. <laughs> wow. So for 10 years, I looked at the information that I failed when I was younger. And when I would look at the book, I would see it and I'm like, oh, I know exactly what I did wrong when I was 16 and 17 that I didn't get right. And it was like, I could know yeah. what was going on in the students' brains because 
I was there. I know how they were thinking because I did that too. <laughs> yeah. So that was the pleasure I had was helping adults learn basic algebra. And that was one of the most fulfilling parts of my career where I had the ability to help people learn and it didn't matter your age because you can learn at any age. Wow. Um, I know you're a big proponent of the pursuit of higher education and we're having a real strong conversation in our social discourse about the value of a college degree. And I want to get your thoughts on how we either change our minds about it or how do we increase the value of it? I am slightly biased. <laughs> I am biased for a higher education. And the reason why I am a big supporter of higher education is because I am a professor. <laughs> I am a professor and I recently started uh, teaching at my campus that I graduated from. I'm starting at teaching research methods in the Africana Studies Department at California State University, Northridge. So I am honored because I am going to be helping the department as well as students understand how statistics and information goes into making sure that systems are equitable and fair and um, diverse for people of various backgrounds of color. So I got here because the fact that I came from an environment, South Central Los Angeles, where education wasn't promoted. And when I went to other areas and was bused into other areas, other school districts, I saw how economically different these areas were and the type of expectations that were placed on the students to succeed. Growing up in South Central Los Angeles, there wasn't that expectation on any one of the students that were in that area. But yet when I was bused over into this other area, that expectation was on them for you're going to go to college you're going to succeed you're going to do this you're going to become a business owner you're going to become a lawyer you're going to become a doctor you're going to provide your skills and expertise to help humanity that was the concept that was instilled in younger people at at the at that age when i was bust into that area so being able to objectively look at the different communities I realized that an education was the ticket to success. Now, there's different types of education. I believe in higher education, which is at a four-year university, but you can also educate yourself in a trade, whether it is uh, understanding how to do construction, whether it is understanding how to do hair, nail. You have to educate yourself in a way to properly do things so it's going to turn out the way that you would like it to do. It doesn't matter what area you're emphasizing or, or specializing in, but you do have to know about it. And you do have to know about it by learning about it. And how you learn about it is you, you go and you hopefully can enroll in a, in a community college, which is affordable for most people, thankfully. In California and other places, you go to a community college, you can get certain courses. You can even finish your high school um, diploma through taking community college classes. So I'm a big person to really promote education because it changed my life. I can't speak about anyone else's life. It changed mine. And so as a result, I'm very um, supportive of education because it transforms the way that we think. The more that we can renew our mind, yeah the farther we can go in life. And I truly believe education can do that. Um, I get approached by a lot of parents who want their kids to find careers in technology. And um, your path in science and math started when you were six, you know, and you had some exposure to things, um, you know, to rockets. And so what are some great things parents can do with young children to help inspire that sort of learning and desire early? Um, just thinking about that off the top of my head, 
the first thing that they can do is make science and technology real. When I was six years old, I went to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and that's here in California, in Pasadena. And there I saw the jet engines and I saw the rockets and I went to their mission control room and I saw pictures of men launching rockets. Now I didn't realize <laughs> that what I was looking at were men launching rockets. They didn't have my same skin color and they did not have, they did not have femininity in the photo. <laughs> And I looked at it and I thought to myself, I, I didn't see that. All I saw was science. All I saw was the ability to do something great and launch something and explode something into the air and help humanity. That's what I wanted to do. And that's what I decided. I had no idea the challenges I was going to face. If parents could introduce their kids to something like that early on, that will forever help set the foundation of, of positive seeds in a child's mind. Those seeds will grow and will be able to fight off the depression and the discouragement that they have as they're growing up because those seeds that are planted in a child's mind early in life helps them see how they can contribute to something that is real. So if you have the ability to take a child to uh, your nearest airport. Show the child how airplanes fly, the, the, how, the, how they land. Do basic things. Take them to a museum, a science museum. Have them look at the different anatomy of the human body and how muscles are formed. Take them to things that will inspire them. If you think that your child's going to be a musician, take them to, the, take them to a, a symphony. And learn, have them teach them to be quiet so they can listen to the music. These are all the different ways to inspire a young person and put, put a positive seed of growth in their brain. The second idea that comes to mind is giving positive reinforcement. I, I was just watching, it was Joel Osteen. It was a sermon that he did online. And he was talking about the comedian Steve Harvey. And this was really interesting when I heard this story. He said that Steve Harvey, when he was a really young person, wanted to be a comedian. And when he told his teacher that, the teacher told the boy which at the time, which was Steve Harvey as a young child, is anyone else in your family on TV? And he said, no. Then she says, go back and write something else down then. And that was something that was very discouraging to him. But his father, from the story that was shared in the sermon, his father came and said, don't listen to that. Listen to this. You can be anything that you want to be. Keep that note and keep your plans and put it first in your drawer. So every time you open up the drawer, you'll be able to see your vision. And that's what Steve Harvey did. So throughout his homelessness, throughout all of these different types of situations that he faced, he kept that in the back of his head, which is I'm going to be on TV and I'm going to be on TV. And one of the first opportunities he had was to be on the Apollo show. If any, I may be dating myself if, <laughs> if, I, if I tell you I remember the Apollo show, but hey, but in any case, he did it. And so that, that story goes to the point of the second point, which is you have to reinforce young people with positive words of encouragement that they can achieve what they want to achieve if they are persistent and consistent. And uh, the last thing I would recommend to do is educate yourself and provide ways for your child to be educated. Now, uh, I grew up in South Central Los Angeles uh, in a gang, highly, in the 1980s. So it was like uh, gangs all over everywhere. There were crack houses everywhere. And it was just really terrible. And my mother found a way for me to be bused into this other school system. And through that education, I got a chance to see that it doesn't matter what color someone is or what their background is per se with ethnicity or their heritage, it matters on what information is being fed into their brain at an early age. 
So with that concept, you want to feed the brain of young people so they have the foundation of being able to build upon in the future. I happen to learn science. I wasn't necessarily good at it all the time, but I happened to learn science. And I just stuck with it. I just stuck with it and stuck with it and stuck with it and stuck with it and stuck with it until eventually I'm like, oh, this is clicking. We have to place kids in an environment where they're exposed to healthy education and keep exposing them to it. Keep putting them in study groups, have them meet with their friends at a, a safe location that is a, a public location where they can study together. You know, uh, make sure, and I always wanna say uh, uh, for parents, make sure and keep your children protected. Not all parents have the same philosophies or ideas as you have. So, but the kids themselves can learn from one another because they're kids. So what you can always do is make sure that they're in credible environments and public type of settings to always keep your kids safe so that when they learn information, they can learn it freely without any fear. So mm -hmm. that's what I have. Uh, last one I have is um, your book, uh, Answers Unleashed 2, the, the Science of Attracting What You Want. Um, it explores a lot about you know, the science of attraction. And I wonder about how your experiences, education, and expertise in rockets and space might have informed, you know, that that sort of uh, concept of attraction. Oh, wow. Um, I did a, a talk about the book Answers Unleashed 2, The Science of Attracting What You Want. And it's if you go to AnswersUnleashed.com slash live lectures, it's my page. And the, the last lecture you see on the page is the talk. So I highly encourage you to go to the page. It's complimentary. You can watch the talk. And the talk I did with California State University Northridge to produce that so people can have free education online. So the talk basically deals with understanding quantum deciding. And basically what quantum deciding is, it's the ability to make your decisions count. There's six different decisions that we make on a daily basis that will attract opportunities to us. And they are making decisions with your faith, how you see your purpose in the world, making decisions with your identity, with who you choose to be in uh, all situations, making decisions with your intent, how you choose to impact and uh, influence uh, environments instead of let the environment change you. The next decision is based on your learning. How do you take in new information and throw out the old information that is no longer accurate or maybe fake news? The, the next is your resources. How do you take your resources and multiply it so what you think is not enough will be more than enough? And then how do you make decisions based on your love and time? How do you love yourself and love other people? So you create positive relationships in the present and in the future. So these are the decisions, the six decisions that count towards attracting opportunities that are come to us. And so we attract opportunities that come to us. And it's not always easy to make these decisions. If it were easy, I'd be a millionaire already. <laughs> 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 but that, that's not that's not realistic. The real the realistic part of it is we have to continuously make wise decisions on a daily basis to keep attracting opportunities so we grow to where we're supposed to be in life. And what allowed me to be able to create this just groundbreaking uh, decision making science based method uh, was three things. It was working at in aerospace because. When I was working as an aerospace engineer, I used mathematics and science to calculate the probability of explosions. So I actually had to see in the future before an event would happen and then come back and make the decisions in engineering and help encourage other people to make the decisions in engineering. So the explosions wouldn't, wouldn't lose the vehicle or cause people to lose their lives, but the explosions would go down the plume 
and the explosion would happen in the right places so it could be a launch and it could be a safe one. But I had to see two different futures in front of me and pick the one in which you were going to go to. And the epiphany moment happened. What if we do that with our own lives? What if we're able to pick the future that we want to go to instead of thinking we have no options? And I started thinking about that in my own life. Well, I, did I use that in my own life? And, and that's when the epiphany came. Oh, I did. I had several different futures that existed for my own personal life. Because I grew up in this really poverty-stricken area, there were three futures that existed for me. I could have been a victim to this surrounding area, and, and or I could have been a dropout, or I could have gone into science when I saw the picture of the men launching rockets when I was six years old. And I unknowingly chose the future where I could launch rockets. I didn't realize what I was doing was picking my future and how I would pick the future was through my decision making to get there. We each have this ability to pick our future by making decisions that are in the present. And the way we make effective decisions in the present is by seeing the future that we want, looking back to the past to figure out what are the values and the lessons we learned through our most toughest situations. And I outline how to identify those six different tough situations that everyone has faced in my book. And from identifying your values and finding out the lessons that you learned in past situations, how to talk to yourself in the past and talk to yourself in the future. So at this very moment, you can make a decision that will get you to where you need to go. That is quantum deciding. And I'm a scientist and I love to make sure things are really solid. I like to make sure there's facts. I like to make sure it's detailed. I like to make sure that what I say is valid. So what I did is I looked at all the science that proved how this is possible. And that included Albert Einstein's quantum entanglement theory of how the past, present, and future are all interconnected in a way in which deals with quantum physics. I looked at this with uh, NASA's teleportation discovery that happened in 2020 when it uh, created long distance teleportation to the future, which was to the space station. So it was hologram technology where they had to actually see in the future and project in the future before it actually happened. And that was the science that was used with NASA there. And then I also used my background, which is my mother is Native American. So with the with the understanding of the principles of how my mother and my mother's family understood how energy worked, realizing that we have decision making that literally changes the energy of situations and the energy of our lives. And so when I paired that with the science and paired that with the energy of how atoms work and how the energy of how our planets rotate around the, the sun, there was this universal story, which is we each have this energy that in this power, I call it the power, the power that comes from our decision making. It's no superstitious thing. This is real. We have the ability to make powerful decisions that's going to change the course of time, but we have to own it. So that is what I learned when I wrote my third book, Answers on Race 2, The Science of Attracting What You Want, is that we each have this powerful decision-making capability and it's up to us to make the six decisions that count. Oh, Olympia LaPointe, so good talking to you.